but you'll see the numbers. There it goes. <clears throat> Here we are, yes. Okay, we are ready, Wayne. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. All right. Um, Great, thank you. My wife, Laura, is here today Hi. also. How's everybody? Good, thank you. All right, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we want to thank you again for, uh, for this day, for this special Sukkot that we can uh, enjoy together in, in virtual uh, company. Thank you for each one that has joined online, for the ones that are watching uh, live on the, on the Bible Explorations website or or on uh, Roku or YouTube, we just pray that uh, this would uh, this meeting would be a blessing and give us further clarity on uh, the life that is in your Son. We ask in His name, Amen. Okay, let me begin presenting and put my slideshow on. show. Okay. So the name of this is Life Original, uh, Unborrowed and Underived. Uh, most of you probably know where that quote comes from, Desire of Ages. We're going to be talking about that later. Uh, but um, I wanted to talk about, uh, start this with, with the three Greek words that are used in the uh, New Testament for life. So the first word is souche. It's from Strong's 5590, it means breath or spirit. Uh, so, for example, when, when Christ uh, died on the cross, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So that was souche. Uh, the second word, uh, or I'm sorry, the second definition for this word, it can, it can mean breath or spirit or the life or life of humans or animals. So uh, in Revelation 8, 9, uh, in the second trumpet, it says a third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. That, that's souche. Uh, and then the next word is bias. That's strong 979. Of course, this is where we get the word biology from the study of life. It means the present state of existence uh, by implication means of livelihood. It can be translated as good life or living. Uh, so an example of this is the parable of the sower uh, in Luke 8, uh, where Jesus said, They that were among the thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life. So it's, it's talking about just the, the existence that we all have. Uh, and then the last word or the third word is zoze, zoe, Strong's 22.22, which can be translated as life but it is the state of one who is possessed of vitality or is animate. It can refer to every living soul. And I love this third definition of absolute fullness of life, both essential and ethical, which belongs to God and through him to Christ, in whom the logos to the word put on human nature. Uh, it can also be life real and genuine, a life active and vigorous, devoted to God, blessed. The portion, even in this world, of those who put their trust in Christ, but after the resurrection to last forever. I really love that one. Um, but this is, this is the life uh, that we want to have, not just, not just the breath of life, not just physical existence, but this vital, animate, genuine, full life. This is the life that uh, Christ came to give when he said, I, I've come that they might have life and that more abundantly. That's what he was referring to. Um, in uh, 1 John 5, 11 to 13, it says, this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. This life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son does not have life. 
these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. So it, you notice the, the word life repeating uh, in, this, in this quote. And uh, take a guess what word, uh, Greek word is used here. In each case, it's zoe. That's the life that we have in Christ. That's the life that God has given to us in his son or through his son. Uh, this is the one I quoted earlier. The thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that they may have life, Zoe, and that they may have it more abundantly. This is the abundant life that Christ came to give to us. First John 1, 1 and 2, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifest, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Once again, uh, the word Zoe is being used here. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. In him, that is, in Christ was life, and the life was the light of men. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Once again, each one of these quotations from John uh, uses the word zoe for the life that, that is in Christ and the, the eternal life that we receive uh, from him and from the Father. So, uh, as you've noticed, nearly every time John uses the word life, it is the Greek word zoe. Uh, there's a few exceptions where he uses the word suche, and I'll share those with you here. Uh, uh, John 10, 11 but Yeshua says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. So in this case, he's talking about his, his uh, sushi, which is when he said, Father, into your hands, I commit my sushi. So uh, I lay down my sushi for the sheep, John 10, 15. So uh, this is a, a quote that some people have referenced to try to say that the Son of God resurrected himself, and that the uh, life that he has, um, uh, that, that, that he has basically the life separate from the Father. But uh, notice, notice the quote uh, from John 10, 17, 18. Therefore, my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from the Father. So I've, I've had some discussion with people on Facebook, and they've quoted this text to me to try to prove that Christ resurrected himself. Even though there's over a dozen places in the Bible, in the New Testament, where it says it's the Father or the Spirit of the Father that resurrected the Son. But let's look at these two words that, are, that I have uh, asked. First of all, I have the power. That's from the the Strong's word exosia, and it actually more, more properly here should be pronounced, uh, um, translated as authority. So I have the authority to lay it down. And so where did he receive the authority from? He says, I received it from my father. So the father gave him the authority to lay down his life. I believe the father gave him that life and the father gave him the authority to lay it down and gave him the authority to take it again. Now that word take, it, it can if you just look at it at face value, it, it seems like the Son of God is taking something uh, back that he, uh, basically taking something on his own. But notice that the word uh, take is from the Greek lombano, which means to receive what is offered. So I have the power to receive it again. Who And by implication, who is he receiving it from? the same one that gave it to him, that is his father. So he's receiving back from the father that which he, the father had given to him before. Uh, let's go on. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Speaking, of course, of the death of Lazarus. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And uh, so the, 
many people have questioned why did Jesus not come when the news originally reached him that Lazarus was sick. He tarried for three days. Well, we're told in Desire of Ages it was for their sake, that is the sake of the disciples, that he permitted Lazarus to die. Had he restored him from illness to health, the miracle that is the most positive evidence of his divine character would not have been performed. Had Christ been in the sick room, Lazarus would not have died, for Satan could have had no power over him. Death could not have aimed its dart at Lazarus in the presence of the life giver. Of course, we know that, that Yeshua had already raised two others other individuals to life, the son of the widow of Nain and uh, Jairus's daughter, but they'd only been dead for a short time. The Pharisees had a teaching that only Messiah could raise someone to life that had been dead more than three days. The Jewish uh, understanding, the soul left the body after three days. And so, you know, there had been resurrections in the Old Testament. Elijah, uh, excuse me, Elisha had resurrected the, uh, the miracle son that had come to the couple that, that made him the, the special room to stay in. Uh, but the resurrections, all the resurrections before Lazarus had been to people that had only been dead a short time. And so this was the crowning miracle of Christ's ministry. And it proved using the Pharisees' own teaching that Christ had to have been the Messiah since Lazarus had been dead for four days. So we've established that Yeshua is the life giver. Both he, he, we receive both our physical existence and our spiritual, abundant Zoe, eternal life from Him. Uh, Jesus declared, "I am the resurrection and the life." This is the quote that the the sermon title referenced. Uh, In Christ is life, original, unborrowed, underived. He that hath the Son has life. The divinity of Christ is the believer's assurance of eternal life. So just a little background. Um, a lot of Seventh-day Adventists teach that Ellen White uh, either was a, was a silent Trinitarian and just didn't want to rock the boat and never said anything to her husband while he was living. And then after he died, she began subtly introducing Trinitarian ideas into her writings, and particularly the Desire of Ages is one referenced in this quote in particular. Uh, the other uh, way that Adventists explain this is Ellen White was not a Trinitarian, uh, but later on she matured in her views. She, uh, you know, God began to reveal these things to her, and so she, she grew in her understanding and that's why she began to, in her earlier writings were more clearly father and son, but her later writings started introducing things that uh, fit more in with the Trinitarian understanding of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So in any case, uh, let's, let's look at, at this um, in, in its original context. So the Desire of Ages, I believe, was written uh, or published in 1898 or 99. I think it was 99. Uh, but she, the, the quotation originally occurred in Signs of the Times, April 8, 1897. So it's always a good idea to look at the original source. Only part of what uh, she originally wrote was included here in the Desire of Ages, so off-quoted statement. Um, and by the way, uh, the, the Another thing is, how do we reconcile this with, with the Bible, uh, where Yeshua himself said in John 5, 26, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. So some have excused this by saying, well, Christ was only saying this, just this was only while he was a human being. Um, but that's a, I believe that's dangerous ground to go on. But basically what you're saying is the things that Christ offered the, the truths that Christ spoke may not have been eternal truths. They were only temporary truth. So the question you have to ask yourself, when Christ said this, was this, an, was this a statement that was true before his incarnation, during his incarnation, and after his incarnation? Or was this only true during the three and a half, 33 and a half years of his incarnation? So that's the question you have to ask yourself. And I would say it, it's the former that this statement is always true, was true in the past, present, and future. Uh, notice these other statements, John 5.30, where Yeshua said, I can of myself do nothing. 
John 5, 19, most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself. John 6, 57, as the living father sent me and I live because of the father. So he who feeds on me will live because of me. So once again, Yeshua said that I live because of the father. All right, so here's the original statement from uh, Signs of the Times. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, quote from John 1, 4. It is not physical life, which is here specified. So what she's saying is not bios or souche, but immortality. It's zoe, that the life which is exclusively the property of God. Now, when she uses the word God there, who is she referring to? It's clear she's referring to God the Father. So she says the life that that immortality is exclusively the property of God. And I believe by implication, it's pretty clear here she's referring to the Father. Because she goes on to say the word who was with God. And I, I put the word thee because in first John, excuse me, in John 1, 1, where it says um, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God. The, the definite article is there. So it actually should be translated. The word was with the God. That, that's what it says in the original. And who was God? I had in nature because I, I believe that that Yeshua has the same divine nature that the father has. And when the Bible says that Jesus is God, it's referring to his nature, not to say that he is the same as God, the father, the one true God. So uh, the word who was with God and who was God had this life. What is that life she's referring to? Zoe immortality which is the exclusive property of god the father physical life zoe not zoe excuse me but, but bios or suche something which each individual receives it is not eternal or immortal for god the life giver takes it again man has no control over his life but the life of christ was unborrowed no one can take this life from him i lay it down of myself we, we talked about that earlier he said, uh, I laid down myself, he said, in him was life original, unborrowed, underived. This life, which life is she referring to? Life original, unborrowed, underived. This life is not inherent in man. He can possess it only through Christ. He cannot earn it. It is given him as a free gift. So the same life that was in Christ, the original, unborrowed, underived life can also be in us. It is given to man as a free gift if he will believe in Christ as his personal Savior. This is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I had the most difficult time understanding what this meant when I first started studying this, the subject of the, of the, uh, of the uh, Godhead. Um, it was very difficult for me because of my Trinitarian background. To, to, to understand what this meant, I couldn't reconcile that with the verse in John 6, where, where he says, or John 5, rather, where he says, um, as the Father has life in himself, so the Son also has life. And as the Father has life in himself, so he has given to the Son that he should have life in himself. So I couldn't reconcile those two, two statements. I knew that Ellen White was inspired. I knew the Bible was inspired. I certainly wasn't going to reject either one of those. And so I had to find a way to reconcile them. And the only way I was able to reconcile them as I studied the statement was that the, when, when, when Ellen White says that in Christ was life original, unborrowed, underived, she was talking about the life of the Father. The Father is life original, unbar unborrowed, underived. The Father from eternity past, uh, when the Son was begotten, has dwelt in his Son. And so his Son has the Father in him. Hence, the Son has life original, unborrowed, and underived. And if we have the Father and Son dwelling in our hearts, we also have in us life original, unborrowed, and underived. That was how I was able to reconcile it, and um, and it and that, and that if if the same if the same life that was in Christ can be in us, then that that that's the only way that it makes sense to me. Uh, let's look at another corroborating reference. This is from also from Desire of Ages. But turning from all lesser representations, we behold God in Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, we see that it is the glory of our God to give. I do nothing of myself, said Christ. The living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father. So she's, she's 
quoting that verse we referred to earlier. I seek not my own glory, but the glory of him that sent me. In these words is set forth the great principle, which the, is the law of life for the universe. All things Christ received from God. Is there any exception to the phrase all things? I would say no. I, when she says all things, I believe she means all things Christ received from God, including his eternal life, his immortality. But he took to give in the heavenly courts and his ministry for all created beings through the beloved son whose life flows to all. It is the father's life that flows out to all. Through the sun, it returns in praise and joyous service, a tide of love to the great source of all. So the father is the source of all life. He has given to his son that same life, and he's also given the son the uh, power to grant eternal life to as many as believe in him. And thus, through Christ, the father, the source, the Christ, Christ, the channel through which these blessings come to us. Through Christ, the circuit of beneficence is complete representing the character of the great giver, the law of life. So those that want to quote the statement in Desire of Ages that in him was life original on the and under life have to reconcile that with the same author's statement in the same book on page 21 that we just read. If Yeshua received life from his father, does that mean he had an origin? And I don't like to use the word beginning because a lot of people did just get up and out of shape about that. But I like, I, uh, does he have an origin? Well, let's look at this statement, which is ironically enough often quoted by uh, Trinitarians to try to prove that Christ had no beginning. So Micah 5 2 says, Out of you, Bethlehem, shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So at first, it appears to be a slam dunk. Uh, Christ has always existed because it says everlasting. But let's uh, look at a couple of those words that I have asked there. First, the goings forth. That word goings forth is from the uh, Hebrew word mocha, and it means origin or place of going out from. So the primary meaning is actually origin. And then the word everlasting is from the Hebrew word olam, which is the vanishing point, time out of mind, practically eternity, uh, ancient time, long time in the past or of the future, and it's sometimes translated as forever or always. Um, and so uh, I, w I normally don't give much credence to the NIV. Uh, I sometimes joke that it's the nearly inspired version. Uh, but in this case, I think they got the translation perfectly. Uh, NIV from the same text is, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. And uh, in, the, in the footnote for the King James uh, Version, I mean, not the footnote, but the marginal reading, the, the word, uh, everlasting can, is uh, the, our alternate translation of that that they have in some Bibles. The marginal reading is from the days of eternity. Uh, but I like here ancient times. I think that's a that's a good translation. Uh, notice how Wagner quoted it in his book Christ Our Righteous, Christ and His Righteousness, which, by the way, Ellen White um, in, endorsed. Uh, Jones and Wagner, and the book Christ and His Righteousness, from what we understand, is a is pretty much a transcript of the sermon sermons that he preached during the ministers' uh, meetings uh, at the beginning of the 1888 conference. And so notice what he says here: the Word was in the beginning. The mind of man cannot grasp the ages that are spanned in this phrase. It is not given to men to know when or how the Son was begotten. And then he quotes Micah 5 2. We know that Christ proceeded forth and came from God, John 8 42. But it was so far back in the ages of eternity as to be far beyond the grasp of the mind of man. Now, I, I don't quote Wagner as you know, an inspired source, uh, but this does show what the early pioneers believed on this. And of course, uh, as I said, he was endorsed his teachings uh, about certainly about righteousness by faith 
and uh, what he presented at the 1888 conference was endorsed by Ellen White. So the, the next question is, I mean, Ellen White does say that Christ is eternal. And the question is, how can Christ be eternal but not as old as the Father? Now, here's my understanding of it. You can agree or disagree. But I believe that the Father and Son are both infinitely old. But the Father's infinite age is greater than the Son's infinite age. Now, that might seem nonsense to you. But let me just share with you, just, just from a reasoning standpoint, um, there's actually an article that you can look up on the Internet if you're interested in, in delving into this. It, I believe God invented math, first of all. I, I believe man discovered it, but God invented it. Um, and uh, this article shows uh, says that infinity comes in different sizes. You may not have ever thought of this before, but it says if you were counting on infinity being absolute, your number's up. It's kind of a play on words there, but it's a, uh, uh, there's a reference there. It's from a Scientific American article. Uh, uh, you can Google... Um, you know, uh, infinity levels of infinity or different sizes of infinity or something, you should be able to find this article. Uh, now I want to give you a, a, another illustration. Uh, this black line running uh, vertically down the middle of the screen uh, represents creation, when creation took place. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us when that happened. I, I do believe that the creation of the earth happened about 6,000 years ago. But when the universe was created, we have no idea. Uh, scientists, based on redshift and their observations of the universe, estimated that the universe is over four, some say five billion years old. Um, whether that's the case or not, I'm not going to speculate. But all we know that it was it was a long time ago, and we we can't God has not seen fit to reveal to us when that happened. Now the only way that we have to measure time is in relationship to space. So before the universe was created, before there were planets and stars and galaxies, there could be no time because time is meaningless unless it is related to space. Uh, that is, for example, and on our Earth, we measure time based on the rotation of the sun and the Earth around the sun and the moon and so on. So when the Bible uses the phrase in the beginning, it is talking about the creation. I believe it's talking about the creation of the universe. Uh, in a secondary sense, it could be talking about the creation of this world. But I believe in the broader sense, it's talking about the creation of the universe. So. When, when the Bible says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and we know that the Bible says that the, that the Son of God was also involved in creation. All things were made by him, and without him nothing was made that was made. So the Son had to have existed before in the beginning, before anything was created, since all things were made by him. So the Son of God had to exist before the creation of anything. So before, to the left of this, this solid black vertical line is eternity. Time does not exist in eternity. I believe the Son of God was begotten in eternity past. How old is the Son of God? He is infinitely old. We have no way to determine his age. It's so far back uh, that, that since, since he was begotten in eternity, the Son of God is eternal, and we cannot count his age in years. I believe Ellen White says something to that same effect. Now, uh, to illustrate uh, what, I, what the pre I said earlier in the previous slide, imagine that this, this number line, this is a number line of integers. And so negative integers are infinite. In other words, this number line, negative one, two, three, four, and so on, goes on forever to the left, and positive integers go on forever to the right. So we could say there is an eternity from the time of creation. There is an eternity that will exist from then on. And before creation, there was an infinite, there was an infinite eternity that existed before then. I hope I'm not getting too philosophical for anybody. But uh, again, an in infinity, an infinite number of of. I, I put in quotes years because there were no years, but an infinite amount. There was an eternity before creation and there will be an eternity after creation. That's the main point that I'm trying to make. Now consider the set of integers. These are, are like whole numbers. 
you know, there's, there's no decimals, no fractions, no square roots. Uh, this is just infinite numbers. Uh, the, these are integers and they are infinite. It's an infinite set of numbers. But now consider the set of what's called real numbers. So real numbers include fractions, they include decimals, and they include uh, square roots. And so, uh, for example, one divided by three, you can't write that as a decimal because it's 0.333333 for eternity. Two divided by three is 0.66666 for infinity. So I don't have all of the real numbers listed. Here. I just put a few as an example. So we're starting at negative one, just so you can see the parallel. So you got negative one, negative 0 0.9, 0 0.8, negative 0.7 all the way to zero and then 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, all the way to one. So you can see just, just from the numbers that I've written, there are 10 times as many real numbers between zero and, be, okay, so between zero and 10, and 10 integers, there's 10 times as many numbers just from the ones I've listed between uh, one and 10. Uh, I, I hope you understand it. So you can see between between zero and one, there's 10 times as many numbers. That's just what I listed here. But there's many more than that that are included. So you could have 0 0.11, 0 0.111, 0 0.1111, and so on. 0 0.12, 0 0.13, 0 0.14, 0 0.15. 0 .15. There are an infinite number of real numbers between zero and one and an infinite number of real numbers between zero and negative one. So the point that I'm trying to make here is even though the integer set is infinite and the real number set is infinite, the real number infinite set is bigger than the integer infinite set. Uh, so that's what the previous mathematical article is talking about, that, that some infinities are larger than other infinities. <laughs> um, and so that the, I, I use this as an illustration that the father and the son can both be infinite the father and son can both be eternal, but the father could have existed before the son existed. That's, that's the only point that I'm trying to make here. And yet they could both be eternal. Both the father and son are our creator. Both the father and son are God in nature, divine nature. The son is not any less of a God than his father is. That is, his nature is no less divine than his father's nature is. But I believe that by definition, God the father has to be older than his begotten son. Um, so uh, let's go on. Uh, some of you have heard, probably have heard of Vance Farrell. He wrote a book called The Truth About the Godhead. And he's trying to prove in his book that the son has immortality independent of the father. On page 16, he quotes 1 Timothy 6, 14 to 16 in the following way. And, and what I'm putting is exactly how it's quoted in his book. Jesus Christ, dot, dot, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality. And he, he did put that in bold in his book. So now if this is true, if what he's trying to say is true, then God the Father cannot have immortality. I mean, because really, if you're, if, I mean, if the, that's what he's trying to prove here is that Christ has immortality separate from the Father. But really, this is not he's really not proving what he's trying to prove. He's trying to prove that the God, the father, God, the son, and God, the Holy spirit all have immortality. But when he's quoting this, he's actually what he, the way he puts this is saying that only Jesus has immortality, but be that as it may. Um, uh, I put this as at best horrible exegesis and at worst, a dishonest twisting of scripture made to support an unbiblical position. So I'm going to quote the full quote without the ellipses, but I'm also going to go back to verse 13, because I believe you need verse 13 to give you the context for the rest. Uh, this is quoted from the King James Version. I urge you in the sight of God, which would be the Father, who gives life to all things. So that goes along with what Ellen White said. The Father is the source of all life. God who gives life to all things. Uh, I urge you before the sight of God who gives life to all things. That, you, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show. Now, now you got to think, who are those um, pronouns referring to, the his and he? I believe when you look at the context, going back to verse 13, they're referring to the Father. And I'll, I'll verify that when we get to the end of the quote. 
to which in his times, that is the father's times, he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, that's referring to the father in this case, the king of kings and lord of lords. Jesus also shares that title. So I, I want to make this clear. King of kings and lord of lords could also refer to Christ. But I believe in this case it's referring to the father who only hath immortality. Now, how to, and, and this is the clincher to me, dwelling in light, which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. So the, the clear question to ask is, has anyone seen the Son of God? And clearly the answer to that is yes. Many people saw the Son of God when he was on earth, but no man has seen the Father or can approach to the Father. He dwells in light which no man can approach. So clearly when it's saying that... Uh, when it's saying that this phrase, who only hath immortality, it is clearly referring to the Father. And so I believe this is this goes along with the rest of Scripture and uh, where it says that the Father gave life to his Son. So the Father alone has immortality, according to this verse. And, uh, the, and the Father gave that life to his Son. And in fact, when the father dwells in the son, the son has the same immortality of the father, but only as the father dwells in the son. When the father separated from the son on the cross, Christ was able to die. And in fact, that, that's the next point that I want to make. Why is a correct understanding of this subject so important? Uh, we all uh, probably heard of B.J. Wagner, not as uh, familiar to Adventists as his father, Joseph H. Wagner, who died the year after the 1888 conference. But uh, he wrote a, a very interesting book on on the called the atonement in the light of nature and revelation and in his book he explains the reason why the seventh day adventist pioneers had a problem with the doctrine of the trinity the great mistake of trinitarians in arguing this subject is this they make no distinction between a denial of the trinity and a denial of the divinity of christ so one of the most common arguments i hear is well you don't believe jesus is really god well, I, I believe Jesus is God. It's just you got to understand what, what that means. He's not God the Father. He's not the one true God, but he has the, the same divine nature the Father has. So, but anyway, so they think that if you deny the Trinity, you deny the divinity of Christ. I, I don't know of any non-Trinitarian Adventists that deny the divinity of Christ. They see only two extremes between which the truth lies and take every expression referring to the pre-existence of Christ as evidence of the Trinity. I, I, as far as I know, all non-Trinitarian Seventh-day Adventists believe that Christ existed before creation. The scriptures abundantly teach the pre-existence of Christ and his divinity, but they are entirely silent in regard to a Trinity. The declaration that the divine Son of God could not die is as far from the teachings of the Bible as darkness is from light. Uh, so that's page 173 of his book. Sorry, and I'll give you, have to go back to that later. So going on, he says, we would ask the Trinitarian, to which of the two natures are we indebted for redemption? The answer, of course, uh, must be to the one which died or shed his blood for us, for we have redemption through his blood. It is evident, then, that if only the human nature died, our Redeemer is only human. And that the divine Son of God took no part in the work of redemption, for he could neither suffer nor die. Surely we say right that the doctrine of eternity degrades the atonement by bringing the sacrifice, the blood, our purchase down to the standard of Socinianism or modalism. That's the, the idea that um, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all the same being, uh, that the Father was uh, the one in the Old Testament, and then he became incarnated as a human being. Uh, and was called Jesus, and then he, after his ascension to heaven, became the Holy Spirit. But they were all the same being. That's modalism. Um, and uh, so that so clearly the Father can't die. And had the Son of God not become a human being, and the Father given him permission to die and removed his presence from him, the Son couldn't have died. But when the Father removed his presence from the Son, he was able to die because the Father was the source of the Son's eternal life. All right, this is from uh, a quote from uh, Ellen White in Fifth Bible Commentaries. There is no one who can, who can explain the mystery of the incarnation of Christ. Yet we know 
that he came to this earth and lived as a man among men. The man, Christ Jesus, was not the Lord God Almighty. Yet Christ and the Father are one. The deity, and I believe she's referring uh, to, to the, the Father, the deity, did not sink under the agonizing torture of Calvary. You know, Christ did, but not the Father. The deity did not sink under the agonizing torture of Calvary. Yet it is nonetheless true that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever will leave them should not perish, but ever ask in life. So a lot of people quote this and try to say that since Christ was divine, he, he, he couldn't have died. But actually, she's referring to the Father here because she uses the phrase the deity. So I believe that is a reference to the Father, not the Son. Uh, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, many to understand that deity suffered and sank under the agonies of Calvary. So it seems to be that those are different. But this is one she says deity did not see, the deity did not suffer and sink. But here she says deity suffered and sank. So I believe in the first, she's referring to the father. In the second quote, she's referring to the son. He was deity, but he was not the deity. So Jesus is God, but he's not the God. Uh, so deity suffered and sank under the agonies of Calvary. Yet Christ, whom God gave for the ransom of the world, purchased the church with his own blood. The majesty of heaven was made to suffer at the hands of religious zealots who claim to be the most enlightened people upon the face of the earth. Manuscript 153, page 1898. And finally, November 28, 1912, the divine author of salvation left nothing incomplete in the plan. Every phase of it is perfect. The sin of the whole world was laid upon Jesus, and divinity gave its highest value to the suffering of humanity in Jesus, that the whole world might be pardoned through faith in the substitute. The most guilty need have no fear that God will not pardon, for because of the efficacy of the divine sacrifice, the penalty of the law will be remitted, and, and divine sacrifices emphasized by me it was not in the original. Through Christ, the sinner may return to allegiance to God. How wonderful is the plan of redemption in its simplicity and fullness. It not only provides for the full pardon of the sinner, but also for the restoration of the transgressor, making the way whereby he may be accepted as the son of God. Uh, when when Ellen White's talking about the plan of redemption, she says that there were angels that offered to come to this earth to die for man. But uh, Ellen White made it clear that an angel could not, one angel, a created being, could not give his life uh, for, for mankind. Only, their, only the divine creator, which was the son of God. And, and by the way, she said only, there was only one being in the universe who could die for man, and that was the son of God. The father couldn't have done it because the father has, has immortality. He, could, he cannot give up his immortality, but if the son received his immortality from the father, then the, and, the, then the, then, and the father withdrew his presence from the son, then the son could give his life. And it was not just a human sacrifice, it was a divine sacrifice. There was no part of Christ that was left alive after he died on the cross. 8208, he, Christ gave himself an atoning sacrifice for the saving of a lost world. He was treated as we deserve, that in order that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which is his. With his stripes, we are healed. He had the Zoe life, and, and the death that he died, he died the death that we deserve. What was the death we deserve? But the second death, a complete separation from God. He, Christ felt on the cross the same separation from the Father, which sinners will feel uh, at just before uh, their destruction in the fires to the last day. Christ spoke, speaking through Moses, said, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. Praise the Father that he gave his only begotten Son to us that we might live through him. And praise God that we don't have to wait for a future time to receive that Zoe, that eternal life. We have that life now through the Son, the same life that is in Christ, in, in original, unborrowed, underived, is that, that it is in every believer. And everyone that believes in, in Christ has the Father and Son dwelling in them, and thus has the same quality of life that has been in Christ since he was begotten of the Father. May that life be in each one of us. Amen.
Amen. All right. Um, I'm going to ask my wife to have closing prayer, if that's all right. Just slide over so people can see you, hon. Loving Heavenly Father, we just want to praise you and thank you for another day of life. For this day of tabernacles that we can worship with fellow believers. Thank you so much for providing the internet to, even though we're all from all over the world, that we can hear each other and communicate and that your presence is among us. We praise you and we thank you. Lord, we, we thank you for the life that we can have, Jesus' life in our life, and that Jesus has the life of his Father. And it can be ours. Father, we're so unworthy, but we just praise you for these, this truth and help these thoughts, these quotations to become real to us and just come alive as we think about your great power and, and love for us. Lord, we're, we just praise you again for your goodness. Lord, be with those that, that have prayer requests. You know each one. And most importantly, Father, we're, we're seeking you at this holy convocation to have a closer walk with you. And, and we, we know that you will answer that prayer. And you will help us to prepare for the hard times that are ahead. Please guide in all the issues in, in, um, in the United States and in, in other parts of the world too, Father. Thy will be done. And, and we just praise you that as we see these world events taking place, it just shows us that Jesus is coming soon. Praise the Lord. We want to go home. So be with us the rest of this day and all the meetings that we have. And we praise you again for your goodness. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. welcome. That was very good. Um, it was a little scratchy. So I'm hoping it's just my internet and not where you are. I don't know how everybody heard it. It wasn't overly clear, but um, you could certainly yes, read it. I, I apologize. Uh, that's one. Yeah, that's that's where it's helpful to have the the quotations on the screen. Where the internet here was at the hotel was not as good as I had hoped, and I had to use my mobile hotspot for for all the presentations. Well, that's so. all right. We got Fine. the point. We're good. We so thank you out. very much. And before I stop, the other one and start, Keith, did you get my message? No. You need to read your messages. Solomon is busy and wants to know if you can swap. He's not able to get on right now. Yeah. The, 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 next? Sure, that's fine. Okay. All right. I'll go ahead and stop and start the other one. So you guys go ahead and visit and... Um, I really liked the number line because on. I wanted to say hi and they're gone now. Oh. It was Joe and um, somebody else. They're gone. Anyway. Who was talking about the number line? I was. Okay, Thanks. go ahead. Finish your thought. Yeah. It, th we're supposed to have things be simple enough for a child to understand. And that is taught in elementary school, the number line. Right. And I think that's absolutely perfect. I'm glad awesome. that helped. <laughs>